for both of you who have agreed most generously to read parts. I'm going to be coming up to you and just holding a microphone to you. <laughs> Those of you who have very generously agreed to read parts of today's program, I will be coming up and kind of sneaking a microphone close to you so those who are watching and for the recording. So it gets through. Oh yeah, thank you. We'll get started in just, well I guess we are at 2.30, aren't we? All right. Get my section. <laughs> Welcome to the kickoff of the fourth year of the Iowa Files, presented in partnership with the West Des Moines Library and the West Des Moines Historical Society. So we're just thrilled that we're, we're able, able to kick off something with something that's unique and creative. Um, we wouldn't be able to do this without the West Des Moines Library, the Friends Foundation of the West Des Moines Library. EMC Insurance and our members and donors. So thank you. Thanks to all of those folks named. That's why we're able to live stream and record all of these programs. So the place, the time, February 1859, two years and two months before the Battle of Fort Sumter that would mark the beginning of the Civil War, the first battles of this most perilous period in the country's history were already being fought along the middle American frontier. Our authors and presenters today, Patricia and Kevin Kimley, have woven this absolutely fascinating tale. It intertwines real people and historical actions with lively and very well-rounded fiction. They live in Ames and travel around the state performing this one-act play that you will see and some of you will be part of, Missives of the Civil War. It's a series of letters that further explore themes of abolition, freedom, and the experience of Iowans during the Civil War. So. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. I am Julia Chapin Grinnell. I was born on November 2nd, 1827 in Springfield, Massachusetts. My older sister, Mary Bliss Day and I, are the only living children out of nine. So many siblings who lived only two or three years, long enough for us to learn to love them, but not long enough to know and keep them. We had an older brother who grew to adulthood, but even he is now gone. Our dear parents have also passed, so we are two, we two are all that are left of our family. The same year I married the Reverend Josiah B. Grinnell, 1852, Mary also wed a minister, the Reverend Pliny B. Day. They reside in New Hampshire. Though a great distance separates us, we remain close at heart. April 15th, 1859, Grinnell, Iowa. Dearest sister, I know that Jos Josiah has already written to Pliny to tell you both of the birth of our daughter, Carrie Holmes Grinnell, on April 2nd. I am now recovered enough to send you additional details, as I'm sure you want to know. She is a beautiful child and seems healthy and strong. I can't say yet if she favors me over Josiah, but her eyes are blue, just like Mary's. Her hair seems to be light with a bit of her papa's reddish gold mixed in. Physically, I am well, much better than after Mary's birth. Of course, Mary's birth four days after we lost George was so traumatic. And though I know it is not faithful to live in fear, I have clung to Mary more in the past two weeks than all of her first year. I fear that once again I shall lose the older child after the birth of the next, as has already happened to us twice. 
I now understand the well of strength our dear mama must have needed to draw from. I think it is safe to say that spring has arrived here in Grinnell. The town is mostly settled down from the fervor and controversy of almost two months ago, though my husband is still quite ebullient. The notorious Captain John Brown passed through here with a group of 12 fugitives he had taken out of Missouri. Their liberation by force was in all the papers, but I don't know if you were following the story. Some folks, though abolitionist in sensibility, objected to the lawlessness of Brown's actions. After all, one of the slavers was killed in the action and much property was taken. When we had the news of Brown's traversing the state, I really did not know how he would be received, even in the several places where he had previously claimed friends. And since he had never been in Grinnell, we had not expected him. Although I had been playfully questioning Josiah about whether he would embrace or reject Brown. So let me relate the events. Captain Brown and Josiah had never met, but when he came to the door, he remembered our Papa to him. At first, I didn't recognize him. He explained that he had been a resident of Springfield and knew my Papa from First Church of Christ. Eventually, I felt I could place his face, but it has aged far more than the 10 years since I might have seen him. His hair is long, generally unkempt and nearly white, his beard also. His face is gone, but his eyes held a fire in them. When he looked at me, I couldn't look away from his gaze. It was mesmerizing. He had an intensity I have rarely seen in a sane person. He asked for our assistance for himself, his men, and the 12 folks he was escorting. JB welcomed him unreservedly. While they were here, the town was all astir. No subterfuge was even attempted as their presence was hardly a secret particularly with so many men and armaments. The Negroes were put up at the hotel and his men either upstairs here or in the wool barn. We kept them two days and the town took up a collection for them. Afterward, Josiah and his friend in Iowa City helped them get to Chicago by train. I believe that the fugitives are safely in Canada now, dear souls. I hope you and Pliny are well I shall attempt to further sketch my daughter for you once I begin to understand Carrie's personality. For now, as you know, a newborn mostly sleeps. Nevertheless, Mary is delighted with the baby and so is her papa. Your affectionate sister, Julia. I am Samuel Harper. I was born a slave in Missouri in 1842. In 1858, I belonged to a Mr. James Lawrence. When he died, all of us slaves were in danger of being sold further south, the settlement of Lawrence's estate. John Brown and his men brought us out of Missouri and escorted us to freedom in Canada. I am Jane Harper. I was born a slave near Lexington, Kentucky around the year 1830. In 1858, I was a slave in the household of David Cruz. I had been loaned out to him away from my Sam. Brown's men rescued me and my master was shot and killed that very night. While we stayed with John Brown's party in, Spring in Springdale, Iowa, Mr. John and Mrs. Edith Painter were very kind to us. Mr. Painter, being a justice of the peace, performed a marriage ceremony for Sam and me. October 1859, Windsor, Ontario, Canada. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Painter, we are writing to tell you that we are safe. We are free, Jane and me. We have rooms with a man and wife who are helping us to learn. And live. The lady of the house is a teacher, continuing for us what you started. That is, teaching us to read and write and cipher. I take any and all jobs that I can find. 
Driving freight is what I find most times, and Jane helps the lady here with laundry and sewing. My mother does a lot of the cooking. God bless you, and thank you for your help. And for Mary and Jane and me in Iowa, Sam Harper. I am Joanna Harris Haynes. I was born in Harrisville, Pennsylvania on November 24th, 1843. At age 11, I came to Grinnell, Iowa with my parents. My parents settled in Grinnell in order to live within a community of like-minded abolitionists. Both my future husband and I were members of the first graduating class of the Iowa College in 1865. Grinnell, Iowa, January 10th, 1863. Dear Robert, I have just finished the Sunday dinner dishes and have a little time this afternoon to write to you. The meal and cleanup is so very little work these days. It is just Mama and me and William here now. Sometimes my sister Amelia and her husband come, but not often. She doesn't like to take baby Charles out in the weather. And William is pretty sullen and just not good company right now since he could not go with our brothers when they enlisted. Mama needs a man here to run the farm. I sympathize with his disappointment, but at least I have one less brother to worry for. James and Samuel have both been gone since November. James wrote me a week ago that the 40th Iowa were moving east from St. Louis. Their company is under the 16th Corps of the Department of the Tennessee. They are happy to serve under their good friend, Colonel Cooper. Mom and I take some comfort in that as, well, since Colonel Cooper is by now considered a seasoned soldier. My brother Ephraim, being a doctor, has already been singled out from the 40th and reassigned to a hospital all the way down south in New Orleans. And Papa has not considered the boy's service in the army enough contribution for our family. In December, at 58 years old, he joined up with the 37th Iowa Infantry. He enlisted because his conscience and his earnest feelings against slavery compelled him. Everyone in the 37th are older men and he promised mama that they won't be sent into battle. They're called the Greybeard Regiment and they have been sent to St. Louis. Perhaps you two will meet up. The campus is so forlorn without many students in the classrooms for we few girls, our coursework has sadly become erratic, constantly disturbed by news of the events and battles by our concern for our loved ones. The reports of Union victories seem to be immediately followed by horrible defeats. Serious and systematic study seems difficult, if not impossible. My dearest Robert, I am glad that you are not in harm's way, but I beg you to be careful nonetheless. Send me news if you can. Yours truly, Joanna. I am Robert Miller Haynes. I was born in Salem, Ohio on December 29, 1838. I was a farm boy and after age 18, I struck out further west in pursuit of my own destiny and advanced education. As an itinerant teacher, I funded my higher education pursuits and my rambling. I made several stops in Indiana before I ended up in Grinnell, where I enrolled at the Iowa College in 1860. A Quaker by birth and upbringing, I could not enlist. Instead, I joined the Western Sanitary Commission at St. Louis and nursed convalescent Union soldiers, war refugees, and freedmen. Somewhere on the Mississippi River, June 15th, 1863. Dearest Joanna, thank you for your last several letters. The honest truth is you provide me with perhaps my only connection to sanity in this world that seems to have gone mad. I've had no time lately to write letters. About eight weeks ago, I was reassigned. The letters were all I didn't find. 
I'm now working on a steamboat, the Red Rover. It is a large side wheel steamboat fitted out as a hospital. We can navigate the Mississippi River and get closer to the fighting and thus closer to the wounded. Time is of the essence in saving these poor men. And we can also traverse back to St. Louis to deliver the wounded to hospitals there. I am working as an orderly, carrying patients and delivering food and supplies around the boat. I've also had to assist doctors occasionally, but I will not describe any of that to you. There are six hospitals up and running in St. Louis now, operated by the Sanitary Commission. That's about 6,000 beds for the wounded soldiers. The ladies of the city provide compassion and care, but there's more need than there are volunteer hours available. I expect your father is probably stationed at Benton Barracks. I have heard of the Greybeards. The regiment guards rebel prisoners being held there. They also assist with the hundreds of freedmen flowing into the army camps. I also expect that I am geographically closer to your brothers than any of us knows. The Red Rover has been running between Vicksburg and St. Louis. At Vicksburg, Grant has them closed off, but the rebel army is dug in. The city can surely not hold out much longer. I long to wash my hands of this bloody war and come home to quiet Grinnell. I long to go back to class and to finish what we started. I long to see you, my beautiful dearest friend, yours, Robert. I am Emily Agnes Jordan, the second child of James and Melinda Jordan. I was born in 1842 in Clay County, Missouri, or the area of present-day Kansas City. My father and mother moved to Iowa, where they founded Valley Junction in 1846. Valley Junction, Iowa, May 1st, 1863. Dear brother, I received your letter dated April 14th. We are all so glad to learn that you are well. We also worry that you mask your trials and those of your fellow Union troops with your characteristic humor. The number of your fellow soldiers in the 23rd Iowa Infantry who will not return to their homes and loved ones grows. I shudder when the casualty lists are published in the newspapers. When you were in Missouri, you wrote in more detail of the events, the challenges, your hopes and fears. Since you've joined General Grant's army and moved through Mississippi, your letters are briefer. But I know the danger is so much greater. If you can write more, perhaps it will help you. It will certainly help me. My dear brother, what have you seen? What do you expect? How long will this go on? What do you fear? What do you hope? I enclose $10 in case that may be of use to you. Know that our love and our prayers are constant. Your sister, Emily. I am Henry Clay Jordan. I was born in 1844. In 1862, at age 18, I joined Company A of the 23rd Iowa Infantry, organized from Des Moines in central Iowa. The 23rd Infantry served in Missouri at Vicksburg and later in Texas and Arkansas. Vicksburg, Mississippi. May 20th, 1863. Dear sister, I received your letter of May 1st. I expect for the next while I can be a better correspondent. So long as you are praying for me just so, I suppose I can take the time for you. Anyway, here's what's kept me occupied since April. Hide and seek. You remember playing that when we were kids? It was especially fun in the dark. Well, we've been playing hide and seek with the secesh soldiers, town to country, forest to river. They keep finding new hiding spots and we keep chasing them out. Except we don't yell boo when we find them. We say surrender. And they say okay to that, but then they just can't stop. Talking, I mean, they surrender just the once. Sassy as you please, these secesh southerners. 
This captain surrenders to us. He says to me, y'all just dirty abolitionists, no blue coats, but black coats. Y'all devils, just like that dirty Abe Lincoln. And they cuss like I shouldn't write. But that captain, he especially seems to dislike me. But I suppose that's because I have some rebukes to his cusses. He looks at me. Where are you from, you dirty tyrant? From the bottom of hell itself. That's where you from. No, I tells him I'm from Iowa. It's a fair bit nicer than hell and a giant bit better than Mississippi. The money you send me is kind, but not to pa too. See, the secession rebels don't know what to do with money either. On one of our backcountry hide and seek days, we came to an old woman's house where there was a quantity of honey. We thought that the little of the honey would do us good. So we undertook to buy the honey from her. That's what General Grant ordered us to do. Buy, don't take. The old woman said she never sold less than a hive. Well, what will you take for a hive, I asked, taking out a roll of bills to show that I meant business. For you to buy honey, you can have it for $20. $20, said I, rather aghast. Yes, and I don't want Yankee greens, neither, said the old woman with the scornful jerk of her thumb. I want real money. What sort of money do you want? I want real Confederate dollars. That there stuff, it don't count here. Oh, you want Confederate money, do you? Well, I can accommodate you, said I, giving her a $50 bill, for which she gave me 30000 each. And then we went to the honey and had a regular so I'm eating pretty well and saving up a good pile of greenbacks. What have I seen, dear sister? I fear I see how this whole war will come out. Our march cross country wasn't all bad, but now we're at Vicksburg. Three days ago, we had a battle close up. We backed up the rebels to the Black River, which is close to Vicksburg in the mighty Mississippi. We pushed them back and captured more than 1,500 secesh troops. The rest ran to Vicksburg. As I write this, I'm looking at a high fortress where the rest retreated, Vicksburg. Everyone expects this will take a while. We'll starve them out if we have to. The river is ours. We'll cut off the flow of troops, goods, food, all of it to the secession states. What do I expect? That this war will take time and it will take lives. Of the more than 900 Iowans in our company, close to 300 won't be coming back. I just visited a friend from Story County in a field hospital. I hope he makes it. But if he makes it, it'll be without the bottom part of his right leg. Somehow, I know that I'll make it back to Iowa to see you and everyone else. I don't know when. I don't know where the war will take me. No matter how hard coming battles will be, I'll end up better for fighting in them. And so will the Union. You keep praying, and I'll keep trying to find ways to laugh. I remain your brother, Henry. I am Josiah Bushnell Grinnell. I was born on December 22nd, 1821 in New Haven, Vermont. I have been a schoolmaster, a land surveyor, a preacher, and a lawyer. I dreamed of living among neighbors who care about freedom and equality, education and godly living, and I built that town. I pray that now we can create that nation as well. Washington City, February 1st, 1865. My dear wife, it is hard on my patience, knowing that I will send you news of which you will see in newspapers before you read it from my hand. But I shall attempt to share with you what was my view of yesterday's most momentous occasion. Congress has now passed the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. Section the first read, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist in the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Oh, what glorious words. The re-election of President Lincoln gave such potency to popular voice that enough members previously opposed were swept into the majority current, thus voting aye. On the making of the question, there was a profound silence in the house, crowded galleries, and the most intense emotion. Solemnly, Mr. Thaddeus Stevens said, we are about to ascertain the national will by another vote to amend the Constitution. The gentleman opposite will yield to the voice of God and humanity and vote for it. I verily believe the sword of the destroying angel will be stayed and this people be reunited. After passage, without a vote to spare, 
It was a sublime moment at which the Congress was adjourned. It was a scene of handshaking, caressing, throwing up hats in the air, lifting a great burden from the loyal heart. The contagious joy reached the White House where Mr. Lincoln was serenaded and congratulated upon this amendment vote, which shall be read around the world as a great moral victory. Oh, my dearest Julia, the joy of participation in this great event, for this moment at least, makes up for the separation from you and our girls. It almost makes up for the tedium and the red tape, which are hitherto the contaminants war has applied to the civil service. We shall see whether this victory might lead to a swift conclusion of the war. I now have modestly elevated hopes. Yours, Josiah. On April 9th, 1865, Union Army General-in-Chief Ulysses S. Grant accepted Confederate General-in-Chief Robert E. Lee's surrender at Appomattox, Virginia. On April 12th, 1865, Abraham Lincoln paused in his labors to pen a reflective and affectionate note to his wife, Mary. Mary kept this note with her for years, reading and rereading it for comfort. Executive Mansion, Washington City, April 12th, 1865. My dearest Mary, how quickly my concerns have switched from matters of war to peace. A petitioner has just left who asked for a permit to travel to Virginia. It was my delight to tell him that no pass is needed. He can go and return just as he did before the war. Other issues of peace remain more difficult. I've perhaps been too fast in desires and plans for reconstruction but I feel strongly that reorganization of the Southern states can't be directed from Washington, though there is no shortage of ideas on how that very thing should be done. We can't undertake to run state governments in all the Southern states. Their people must do that, though I reckon that at first, some of them will do it very badly. Now at the end of the four years of war and struggle, the nation's condition is not what I or anyone could have devised or expected. Only God can claim foreknowledge of what has come. As God wills the removal of our great wrong, he wills also that we of the North, as well as those of the South, shall pay fairly for our complicity in this injustice. Oh, that we may rever his justice and goodness of the Almighty and continue to take up the work of building the United States to his will and the great ends he ordains. Surely he intends some great good to follow this mighty convulsion, which no mortal could make and no mortal could stay. Let us strive to be more cheerful, Mary. Between the war and the loss of our darling Willie, we have both been very miserable. Let us start to dream of what lies beyond our time in Washington and the years that stretch peacefully ahead. We should travel. I would so much enjoy traveling west to California, then perhaps to Europe. Years ago, we dreamt of a pilgr pilgr pilgrimage to Jerusalem, a city and land that we have always wanted to see. I've set up two hours on Friday afternoon for us to take a carriage ride. Let us visit on these things. Spring is arriving, and perhaps we can find some of the festiveness of the season for ourselves. General Grant has sent his regrets on our invitation for he and his wife to join us at Ford's Theater that evening, so please find another couple to join us. I do hope others don't think us disrespectful of Good Friday by attending a comedy, but my wish is for laughter over lamentation. Amen. The two men who had warned Lincoln most often about his personal safety were Secretary of War Stanton and Marshal for the City of Washington and Chief of Protocol at White House events, Ward Hill Lamont. To Lamont, he had laughing retorts. The envelope on which he had written assassination, wherein he filed threat letters numbered 80 items by late March. He told Seward, I know I am in danger, but I am not going to worry over threats like these. He told Lamont, as long as this imaginary assassin continues to exercise himself on others, I can stand it. I think the Lord in his own good time and way will work this out all right. God knows what is best. On Friday, April 14th, 1865, at 10.13 p.m., John Wilkes Booth entered the back of Lincoln's theater box at Ford's Theater, crept up from behind, and fired a pistol at the back of Lincoln's head 
mortally wounding him. Lincoln's guest, Major Henry Rathbone, momentarily grappled with Booth, but Booth stabbed him and escaped. Lincoln was taken across the street to Peterson House. After remaining in a coma for nine hours, Lincoln died at 7.22 a.m. on April 15th. Stanton saluted and said, now he belongs to the ages. Would you like to stand and sing Amazing Grace with us? <laughs> There's two, two verses on the bottom of your program. <laughs> Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. So we are um, immigrants to Iowa. <laughs> we moved here in 1989, but our green has not been revoked as yet. <laughs> but we were returning uh, in 2005 from seeing family in Nebraska where we both grew up. And our poor children, we have three kids, I suppose didn't get to Disneyland with little, they got to go to the and historic sites. So on one of those trips, we had stopped in Nebraska City and saw uh, Brown's Cave and insulated up there. there. Went on to uh, Denver, and then on, Lewis. on here to the Jordan House, that's long, and then on to Grinnell, which is sort of the pathway of the book, all the only follows. But uh, having not, I guess, had an education on Iowa history since we grew up in Nebraska, we're just uh, really surprised at sort of the events leading up to the Civil War and that many of these prominent Iowa characters like James Jordan, J.B. Grinnell and others were very prominently involved in not only the Underground Railroad but in events leading up um, to the Civil War. And so I'm an economist, not a historian. <laughs> Patty is an artist, <laughs> but we love stories and uh, so started to piece together what ultimately became the book, start to visit with friends like John <laughs> to get ideas and feedback. Um, anyway, it's just been cool. And mm -hmm. yeah, I started the book a long time ago and it never would have been finished if it wouldn't have been for Pat. <laughs> he had about uh, 10 or 12 chapters written and bef before he uh, took a position with the Iowa State University and he really never got back to it after that. <laughs> so. Uh, when our daughter was, who had been the youngest on that trip, was uh, graduating from high school, I kind of decided I was going to need something else to occupy some of my time. And so I started working on it. And uh, 
I love re research and history, and so I dive down all the rabbit holes. And so Kevin had sort of mapped the the plot and the characters, and I didn't change a whole lot of that, but I had a lot of filling in to do. And so I say that I was research and writing, and he was story consultant. So he enjoyed it when he would come home from from a work, and I usually would spend kind of a week or two researching a, sp a spot and then writing. And so then I, I would have a, a, a recitation for him and ask his opinions on my dialogue and my character presentations. So. We have a question from online. Somebody wants to know who is the most surprising or interesting character you research. Calvin Bradway. <laughs> he was in uh, southeast Pottawatomie County. He was a uh, someone where uh, Brown and his party stopped after leaving um, the Tabor and Fremont County area. And he, from all the descriptions, he wasn't an abolitionist from religious con conviction. He was such an individualist. And his later life is really quite um, interesting in that he tended to uh, sue people, neighbors, and he was always causing uh, legal actions. He actually, um, after his wife died, he married Barbara Mayhew, who was the Mayhew cabin in Nebraska City, also known as John Brown's cabin. Uh, and then he was under house arrest with a marshal, and someone shot him through a window in the cabin where he was under arrest. And no one was ever uh, prosecuted or arrested for his murder. <laughs> so it was a very interesting story, <laughs> but not probably what you're thinking in terms of the most upstanding. <laughs> I think the most, maybe not surprising character, but surprising set of events just to learn about and and, and try to appreciate it in historic context is, you know, these people like J.B. Grinnell, you know, they were, they were, they didn't even drink. <laughs> and they were creative in doing things for sure. They were entrepreneurs and they were coming to a frontier, but, you know, they, they broke this thing called the Fugitive Slave Act. And, you know, it's easy, I think, for us today to be like, well, of course, they're on the right side of history, and they are. But really understanding back then, it wasn't that clear cut, and it was controversial, and it hurt their economic interests. Because <laughs> it was just complicated. Iowa was certainly not a pro-slavery state, but even here, um, racial pre prejudice was not, you know, something that didn't exist, unfortunately. And it was just controversial in their courage and sort of you know, having the, the courage of their Christian convic convictions is just very impressive. Not only that, but many of them, many of the people who were conductors or uh, station man masters did so while they were serving either at county or state level office in the state legislature or as, uh, you know, county supervisors and that sort of thing, so. And John Brown remains, uh, interesting character in American history and when we've done these events in the past you know people will ask us about him and Patty do you think he was crazy that's a question <laughs> that we've gotten <laughs> um, I, I wrote it in a bit of a it, uh, I've started a sequel and I wrote a scene where uh, JB Grinnell and John Bruner the the fictional character are asked that question. And J.B. Grinnell forever afterwards called his living room the Liberty Room or his parlor. And so he was, he never, uh, never forswore his support for Brown, even though he was investigated uh, after Harper's Ferry. Um, but then I have, uh, have the fictional character say, yeah, I think he was just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, did you follow that last trip of, of Brown and 
uh, his interaction, I think, with Frederick Douglass, and and then ultimately wasn't he captured by Lee? Do you talk about that at all? I mean, to me, that's fascinating. That whole part of history. Yeah, Frederick Douglass didn't want to have anything to do with his plans. Yeah, yeah. and he was he was not he was not um, prosecuted and and executed by the federal government. He was prosecuted by uh, the or state of Virginia. Virginia. So Lee was definitely involved in the military proceedings. Yeah. Yeah, but Frederick Douglass, obviously a very brilliant guy, very much foresaw <laughs> what was going to happen and didn't think it was at all realistic and tried to warn him off of the path he was taking. And yeah, it was, he saw it all. Talked about uh, bleeding, bleeding Kansas and all in your book. Can you talk a little bit yes. about that? Yes. Going on down there? Um, so one of the fictional characters, the the female lead, you would call her in in uh, movie speak, uh, came, came was uh, it, born in New York, and her parents immigrated to Kansas with the opening of the territory, and she stayed behind and went to school, and then she moved to Kansas. And um, so from her perspective, we tell a bit of the story of, of the, the five years before this, uh, Brown's activities in, in uh, Kansas, uh, living in Lawrence and the sacking of Lawrence and all those sorts of things. The, the border ruffians and the bad guy is actually named, so the bad guy in the story is named General Stringfellow. And there were actually two brothers from Virginia who settled in uh, Weston, Can uh, Missouri, Kansas City area. And they were both border ruffian types. One moved over to Kansas and got elected into what they call the bogus legislature. And the other eventually just became a railroad promoter and moved into Salina, Kansas, or I'm not sure if it was Salina, but the other went back and he was a doctor and served in the Confederate army as a surgeon. So those two guys, they were Benjamin and Frank Stringfellow. Mm -hmm. So that's where General Stringfellow comes from. You know, it doesn't happen anymore, but back when Missouri and Kansas were both in the old Big 8 or Big 12 conference, they always called the football or basketball games the border war. Yeah. And I never thought about it. <laughs> but there's a real basis in history for that stuff. And, you know, I was looking yesterday, I was at the Iowa State football game, and there's a player who comes from Lawrence and he went to Free State High School. <laughs> okay, right. So these things persist, mm. you know, to this day. <laughs> but Lawrence hasn't been sacked in a while. <laughs> well, nice. it was sacked again later yeah, <laughs> with Quantrell, but. You know, there's an author, I'm going to forget his name now, but he, he wrote a best-selling Lincoln biography of which there have been many. Um, fascinating character, but his sort of thesis in the biography was that the United States was the only country that got to the point of civil war to get past slavery. And so he really lays at the feet of Lincoln, kind of blame for the fact that it went to there. But I just don't buy that. <laughs> uh, it was percolating up through the people. Now you can certainly say violence between people is not a good thing, um, but it was happening and it was happening in Kansas, it was happening in Missouri. You know, there certainly were instigators like Brown, but there were a lot of others as well. And it came up here to Iowa. <laughs> I really appreciate the fact that you added the Harpers in, mm -hmm. in the book. Because mm -hmm. it's, the focus is so often just on the white people who were part of the Underground Railroad. And I think giving Samuel and Jane a voice was really critical to the authenticity. And since you do know about them, and <laughs> have a picture of them taken in Canada after freedom, I think they're just two amazing characters. Yes. Uh, yeah, trying, <laughs> as we wrote this, you know, we wanted to do, you know, honor certainly to the people that participated in the Underground Railroad, but to try to do it for those that were fugitives as well. Um, 
more challenging, but um, we had some friends that I think provided us some good advice at trying to give voice to those characters from that time as well. The slaves that came through Iowa, where did they originate, do you know? Um, most probably from Missouri and Arkansas. Of course, since nothing's written down and documented, it was hard to know. Certainly the, the Western Iowa Trail would have been coming out of the Missouri area for the most part. Um, there, were, there was some a, a few families who held slaves in Nebraska City, and there's a fairly famous story about um, Stephen Knuckles, who uh, was in Nebraska City, and he went all the way to Chicago to reclaim his two female uh, fugitives. Um, but I think in Eastern Iowa, it would have been more from further up, more the, you know, Missouri Delta, not not deep south, but a little bit broader uh, the people pulling up through the Mississippi Valley. And we have no idea the numbers uh, of, of individuals who, who were actually helped along their way. Um, I spoke once with um, Lowell Soike, who's retired from the Historical Society, the State Historical Society. And he said the historians put it anywhere between 50 and 500. I don't know. Um, David Conan has documented I think he has 37 names of individuals who had who were in Grinnell through and helped along through the through that specific town. So there's a lot of even stories in like Eldora. Yeah, yeah. Not well documented, but you have to figure the stories are probably based on something. Mm -hmm. Did your book at all address Native Americans? I, I that whole chap, that whole period of time where we just had incredible disruption of, of, and migration of peoples across this state. Mm -hmm. Was that at all part of your story or was that outside your That's kind of outside the yeah. realm. Um, yeah, well, yeah. Grinnell later was involved. Grinnell, Grinnell and Jordan both were assistant, uh, gave assistance to the Meskwaki tribe uh, a couple decades later. Mm -hmm. um, but not it wasn't in my story anyway okay. yeah well if there are no more questions i would like to thank the kimleys for coming here today <laughs> <laughs> one of the viewers online said that they had a tear in their eye when you all were singing yeah. amazing <laughs> and i, I guess we sang it pretty well yeah <laughs> No, it wasn't me that was making people cry. It was all of you guys. <laughs> so, um, again, thanks to the West Des Moines Public Library, the Foundation, the Friends Foundation of the West Des Moines Library, EMC Insurance, and donors and supporters. If you'd like to learn more about the Underground Railroad, just so happen to know a museum that has tours that focus on the Underground Railroad. <laughs> That's quite the segue, isn't it? <laughs> Fridays and Sundays, 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. Um, next month's Iowa Files will be a whole in one. It's going to be golf course designer Joe Wandro, who will explore the history of Waveland Golf Course. It was built in 1901. It is the oldest municipal golf course west of the Mississippi. So bring your clubs and ask some good <laughs> questions. No, don't bring your clubs. That's not cool. So thank you again to the Kimleys, and they'll be more than happy to answer questions and autograph copies of the book. Mm -hmm.